the climate changes, the world's coastal countries are under ever-increasing threat from storm surges and sea level rise. But here in Holland, they've had centuries of experience designing a complex network of ditches, pumps and dikes just to stay dry. I'm Russell Beard and I've come to the Netherlands to meet an innovative group of architects and urban planners who are leading the way in designing for a wetter world. The Netherlands is one of the lowest lying countries in the world. Over a quarter of the nation is below sea level, so they've always battled to stay dry. But with sea levels rising, they're stepping up the game. In the town of Katwijk, engineer David van Ralten is working on coastal defense. We have 900 meters of dike underneath the dune. We have no idea that there is a massive piece of concrete underground. Although this looks like a beach, it's all man-made. This state-of-the-art sand and concrete coastal barrier is part of a 20 billion euro water management program that includes shoring up the country's sea defenses for the centuries ahead. We would like to know what happens with our coastline in the next 200 years if we go for the most extreme scenario of two meters of sea level rise. What are we talking about here when we're, when we're talking about sea level rise? What's the, what is at, at stake? What's the risk? Well, the risk is that we have a breach in our coastal defense line and then a large part of the Netherlands will be flooded. We have worked for 800 years already on water management in the Netherlands. That has been our struggle to keep our land safe from the sea. And that's what is at stake. You know, can, we, can we protect our country for the, for the future also? And uh, knowing that uh, two thirds of the country is under threat of the sea, something needs to be done. You're planning for the worst. You're planning for the worst, yeah. This is nice, isn't it? What do you think of when you hear about sea level rise and the danger of flooding? Having, uh, we have to buy a rubber ball, put it on the attic, <laughs> uh, just in case. Huh? Yeah. You don't think you don't think you can hold back the sea forever? No, I think it will take more 200 years, but eventually uh, we have to give it back to the ocean. Huh? While the Netherlands doesn't plan to relinquish large chunks of its land anytime soon, a growing number of engineers and architects argue that as well as fighting to hold back the water, it's about time to learn how to live with it. So we're looking for Kuhn Althaus. Uh, he's part of the Netherlands' new wave of aquatics. He's waiting for us. How are you, Hey, good Hi. Hi, Russell. Good. Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you. Thanks. For those who've never heard of it, what is an aquitect? Well, I think an uh, aquitect is, is an, an architect that uses water to make cities perform better. Uh, we know we have all this climate change, we have urbanization, and we think on water we can have that all. If your city is threatened by water, I think the safest place to be is on top of the water. My name is Oldhuis, which means old house, and my, my family from my father's side they were all architects. Right. And on my mother's side, they were shipbuilders. She's called Boat, and they build ships. And I thought, now, oh, who will it please? My father, my mother, building boats, building uh, houses. But bring it together, it all makes sense. Kuhn's idea comes down to some pretty simple technology. Floating foundations that can support a new generation of buoyant buildings. You wouldn't have known that they were floating. Yeah. If there would be a flood over here, these houses would rise up. There are stilts next to it, so they can glide up and down. These homes are built on floating foundations of steel wrapped in a watertight material with concrete weights in the basement to keep them stable despite their height. They expect here, in the worst case scenario, a meter, meter half of water. And then these houses can go up and down with that. Hi there. In the past 12 years, Kuhn's created nearly 100 floating homes in the Netherlands, ranging from amphibious houses to houseboats to these modern water villas. Olaf Janssen moved into his home near Rotterdam last year. Hello. Hi, I'm Russell. Hello. Hi. You could swim under that if you wanted to. If, uh, if, yeah, yeah, if you'd like to, yes. And uh, this will be the last uh, place here. Open space for uh, one house. Yeah. So you wow. see the other side. Amazing. Beautiful, man. Oh, but this is absolutely amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Because it's now a little windy, 
you don't notice anything that the house is moving. With a houseboat, then it starts moving already, mm -hmm. and this house doesn't move that much. Does this do justice to your concept of the floating house? We talked about evolution yeah. of, uh, of houses. We had the small houseboats in Amsterdam, first as steel ships, then as concrete slabs from, from 5 by, by 20. Mm. And this is, this is not a houseboat anymore. This is a regular villa, three stories, completely sustainable, uh, doesn't need that much energy. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is absolutely a step towards what I think should be done on water. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're talking floating houses and mansion houses. Who's really going to benefit? you see of here is called old school architecture, floating architecture, because the things we're now already thinking of are much larger and much, this is for the rich. You have to go to high densities, floating apartment buildings, uh, floating solutions for slums worldwide. Now, but it all comes down to the technology that we innovate here in these big, huge, beautiful villas and see how we can distribute that over the world to other neighborhoods next to the water. Although Kuhn spends part of his time designing floating islands for the world's super rich in the Maldives, Dubai and China, he believes his technology can make a big difference to the people who are most vulnerable to the rising seas. Every day, 100,000 people worldwide go to cities. That, that's a city in itself, every day. There is not space enough in the city, so the people take the, the space that not been occupied yet. And that's mostly the most vulnerable locations next to waters. We think that at these locations, it's most interesting to bring some of the functions that last and that are less vulnerable. So you can, get, you can bring in their uh, energy, clean water, uh, even some housing, and all these kind of functions uh, we can just put on, on floating barges. From health clinics to schools to sanitation services, Kuhn sees the potential to adapt his technology in order to provide services not normally found in informal settlements. For a city, it's very difficult to bring in new kind of buildings because then they would accept the fact that there are slums. Mm -hmm. So we have to do it more in a temporary way. We bring in floating functions, which also can be taken out immediately. So there's no, not a formal status for that. Mm -hmm. And it means it's much easier to go through, around the rules mm -hmm. and upgrade life over there because in the end, that's what it's all about. That's interesting because this is a world away from the $14 million floating mansions in in the Maldives, isn't it? This is a different it, 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 is, it, it is different if you look at it upon like, like architecture and who is using it. But the floating technology mm. and the safety and, and how we, we treat that environment is exactly the same. Floating services in slums and floating homes in the Netherlands are all part of Kuhn's central idea of embracing water and designing cities that can change and adapt in the face of an uncertain future. If you look at a city as a living thing, then you also know that we have to try to change the DNA of that city. Yeah, because we don't know exactly what um, um, climate change will bring us or what urbanization will bring us. But I think a city should be ready for that. 